This conference will now be recorded. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this uh, webinar about how to improve the software quality with static analysis. My name is Joakim, and I work at uh, KnowHow in Sweden, Malmö, and uh, I also have my colleague Mikkel, who is a uh, technical uh, uh, and we'll uh, show the demo later on. Uh, if you're calling in from Denmark or Finland, you can talk to my colleague, uh, colleague Henrik and Marco if you have any questions about this uh, seminar or, or the tools we are presenting. Uh, we are recording the, this webinar, so um, uh, you will get the possibility to, to, um, to view it afterwards, or if you have some colleague that uh, might want to watch it as well. So I'll change. Okay. So it will be uh, about 45 minutes. So we will get an overview of. Uh, static analysis uh, and what it is and also talk about a solution that we provide called code sonar and Mikkel will do a demo and then we have a Q&A session in the end and um, you can always uh, send uh, chat mess messages uh, during the whole presentation so so what is static analysis yes basically it's it's uh, analysis of the uh, a software program source code uh, that is performed without executing the program that means that you look at how the code looks like and you uh, can make certain conclusions of a, of a software so that is usually used for, for validating a coding standard and best practices so you're writing the code in, in a good way you can also find defects like undefined behavior, API misuse, and other suspect behavior like dead code, unused variables, and so on. And it's quite good because you let the computer analyze and you don't have to do a lot of testing, uh, but it will not replace testing. It will be a more uh, a complement to, to dynamic testing but it will give a better coverage because it will search any possible way that you software can, can go. So this is one of the great things about static analysis. So wh what do you get? What kind of result do you get? Well, you get, you get an indication. Uh, probably get, you get some true positive and that is a correctly identified it bug and then uh, all programs also point out uh, false positives that means that you have identified it but it's maybe not correct or not, maybe not uh, wrong in, in that sense or you can have uh, a negative uh, true negative and that is there is no errors and there can be false negatives as well and that means that the tool doesn't find the error at all. So this is a, the four verdicts you can get from a static analysis and all tools do this. So why do this? Well, you can introduce static analysis much earlier. Uh, as soon as you can compile your code, you can start analyze it and test it or find the defects in it. So it's also uh, um, easy to find faults that it's very complex to, uh, to find. You maybe have to write a very complex test case to, to uh, find this error. But static analysis just point out that this could be an error and so on. And it also can be used when you do code reviews so it's point out that here is something wrong in the code and give the code uh, reviewer uh, much more attention 
or what to look at. So this is just an example. Uh, there was a sub software update and um, it, it crashed immediately after deployment. So they, uh, yeah, they found that a, a null pointer, pointer dereference was found uh, or causing this problem and it was find, found very easily with this uh, code zone too. So you save time but it's also important that you build it into the process when you develop your software. So there are many different tools, static analysis tool on the market. Uh, there is a Lint-like tools. Lint has been around since, since the 17th, 18th. Uh, most common is maybe PC Lint. Uh, and they look, this kind of tool, they just look at uh, the file and the construction of the file. Um, then we have, <clears throat> yeah, you, you can do some standard checking and, and uh, probably you get a, a lot of noise because these programs doesn't understand how the software is, is uh, built. And then we have a very a verification tool on the hand where you build uh, or you can determine exactly uh, what goes wrong uh, and, and here you need to, to have some formal language uh, or something that you uh, can verify and uh, advanced code uh, analysis is what we're going to talk about today um, it's more that you build a model of your code and then you analyze that model and that makes a more uh, abstract execution of a code, even if a code is not executed. So you can find much more things, concurrency, flow controls, tainting data, uh, and it works both on source and binary code. So what, what is CodeZona? What, that I have been mentioned a couple of times. It's a, it, it's a tool developed by a company called Grammatech, and that is a US-based company, and we have been working with them for seven, eight years. So probably it's, it's the deepest static analysis tool on the market for C and C++. Uh, and it's designed to find the root cause of a problem, and to find the bugs. And it has quite a nice uh, user interface that uh, allows the developers to see what's really going wrong. wrong. And it's, of course, highly customizable with workflows and checkers and so on. So there is a couple of versions of this code sonar. Uh, it's for source. It's for libraries when you also include uh, binary libraries in the analysis and then there is binary analysis that is more reversed engineering of a code and there is a functional safety kit that is used for uh, development where you have more requirements like 26262 or, or medical or whatever you, business you want. Uh, what's new uh, coming in this um, uh, month is is code sonar uh, for C uh, C uh, C sharp and uh, Java as well. And this is just uh, some customers, and all of these customers they are working on in the technical field, uh, and since that we are using C and C plus uh, plus. So many customers are embedded de uh, developers or, or do, uh, embedded software developing companies or companies that are using a lot of C and C++. So what does CodeZona does? Well, it takes the code and uh, it looks on how you build it. So it looks at your build script 
and it uh, parses the code according to your build script. So that means that you don't miss any files or something that you when you build a system. So CodeSonar do, does this automatically by looking at your how you build the system. And after it's parsed, it will build up a model uh, and then it's run some algorithm on that model to find problems. And then it's uh, have a way to explain these problems to, to the engineers, the software engineers. So basically these, these three things or steps is done with CodeZone. So you have your source, you have your binaries, you put it in code sonar. Uh, and uh, this model has a, a lot of things in, inside, name tables, uh, call graphs, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And all the warnings will be stored in a database and it's called the hub. And in this database, you also connect a web browser so everyone can look at the result via a web browser. Uh, you can also connect it to uh, different IDEs like Eclipse or Visual Studio or uh, uh, Visual Code, I think it's called now. So the main purpose of a hub is actually twofold. It's one, to store the analysis result and also uh, do a comparison uh, of different builds and so on. But it also includes the license mechanism. That means that you don't have to install any local licenses and so on. So everything is on the hub. And uh, you usually have one hub for one company or project or depending on the size but usually one hub that everyone can access and you need to have access to this hub when you do analysis. So this is a typical uh, workflow that you usually have. Uh, some developers check out code, compile, do something with the code, compile again and then check in. And then you have probably some build server that check out the code, compile and packaging that to two different things. So either you can put code sonar on the build server and uh, get the result, or you can put it in the developer workflow, or you can of course have both. Code sonar is, is quite nice because you can run different presets, and that means that you have different settings. So you can uh, put on put on some, on, uh, some um, deeper uh, analysis on, on the, the nightly build where you can have more, more faster analysis on the developer uh, side. And uh, you can also connect CodeSonar to the, the CI workflow. This is an example how uh, a GitHub uh, review can be made uh, by CodeSonar. So then it checks all the uh, commits that you do and, and if they have any errors. Okay, so with static analysis in general and code sonar especially, you get better quality. You can improve both security and safety and you can get easier compliance with different standards. So that was a short introduction. So uh, I will hand over to, to Mikkel to uh, present and give you a, a view in the tool itself. So I will Thank change. You. I will make you presenter.
Uh, okay, let's see. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Good. Okay, hello everybody. My name is Mikkel Gustafsson and I work on the technical side of NOAA Solutions. I'm going to make this demo for you guys. And I thought I'm going to start this demo by showing you some different ways to start an analysis with code sonar. So first, we're going to, to have a look at what code sonar's own GUI looks like. Can you see this screen now? Yes. Joachim? Good. Yes. Thank you. Um, and here, we can choose where we want to save our project files, code sonar's project files. And uh, we can choose a project name or to which project we should save our do an analysis and uh, also the hub address and if I press next uh, here I can choose a preset. A preset is a set of warning checkers that are turned on. So for right now we have a new preset that means that we have a not every checker is turned on, but we have a, uh, default settings right now. But uh, we can uh, choose different ready-made presets. So here we have presets, for example, for search C, search CPP, uh, and if you want to look at concurrency problems, you can turn this on. And uh, we can turn on all warning classes also. And I think it's around 30 different presets that are in the installation. Misra, for example. And it is very easy to create your own company preset. Um, you just cut and paste the warning checkers that you want to use into a text file and then you save it to a preset folder in your installation. And then it will show up here also. Uh, and this is very good. For, for example, if you want to make a bit lighter analysis before you check in your code, you can use a preset for that. And you can use another preset uh, when you're doing a nightly build, for example. And if I press record here, code so now we start to listening in on all processes that are working. And when the compiler starts to build the code, and if code sonar recognizes the compiler, it will start to parse the code and build up an internal representation of the code that Joachim mentioned earlier, and use that for its analysis. So this is a GUI that you should use, you could use if you're doing analysis before you check in your code. Uh, if you're using a big Mikael, machine, uh, yeah, Mikael, I, I got the comment that uh, if, if it's possible to, to zoom up a little bit, I think this, this uh, was a little bit small. This uh, okay, maybe uh, it's, it's get bet better later on. Okay, let's see. Yeah. Can yeah. you see the, the text here? Yes, yes. Uh, if you don't use Cosmos own GUI, you can use a command line. Uh, this is a very basic analyze command here. So it's just code sonar and you add analyze and the project name and the hub address followed by your build command here. And uh, you working mentioned earlier also that you could use a plugin for Eclipse and Visual Studio. And everything you, that you can do uh, in code sonar's GUI or in com by command line, you can also use uh, these plugins. And the results will also be shown in your IDE. And if you're using Build Machine, uh, there's a plugin for Jenkins. So here is a very small Jenkins project that we have been using. Uh, and the plugin here shows these two graphs, total number of warnings and lines of code. 
and the plugin also gives you a link to the latest analysis. And uh, the plugin, we can also set some uh, different conditions on, so to set the build to unstable or failed, for example. If you get a warning increase in percentage here, we can set it to unstable or failed. If, we, if it increases above these levels. And uh, for this uh, project, we have also extracted two different kinds of reports we have created and added to this build. And as before, it's basically the same parameters that we're using as via command line as uh, in, uh, in the Jenkins build. So let's take a look at the actual code sonar. So here I have uh, installed the hub is locally on my computer. And I use my Chrome browser to connect to the hub. And I, here the first page shows all the different projects that I've been working on. And for this demo purpose, I use an open source project. Uh, it's actually GNU Chess. It's a chess program. And we can see that it's 12,000 lines of code, so it's not very large. So I click on that, and I will come to the latest analysis I've done here. And we can see I used the default settings for this analysis. I got 83 different warnings here. And I can compare that with some previous analysis I've done here. Uh, now I turned on all the different checkers Users, and we got 4,240 warnings on 12,000 lines of code. And uh, now every MISRA checker is also turned on. And if you have written code uh, that has not been written for MISRA, you will generate a lot of warnings if you use MISRA checkers. Can you see my screen good now? I, I think it's good on my computer, but... Yes, for me it's good. Okay, great. So I get this list of all, all the warnings. And we have some different columns here. Let's have a look what that means. So the first column is a score column. It goes from zero to 100. The higher the number, the more severe code sonar I think it is. And this is very useful when you want to have a look at the problems. You know where to start first start looking. And it's also color coded here. It's red uh, and yellow and it also turned green later on. And ID column. Every warning gets a unique ID number. And code sonar uses a fingerprint method. So even if this warning moves in code, uh, code sonar uses a fingerprint method to, to determine this is the same warning and it will get the same ID number. And this is very useful uh, if you want to suppress the warning. You don't want to see this in this analysis or in a later. So if you've got the same ID number, it will be stay suppressed. Class, what kind of warning it is. Significance is a high level indication of what kind of warning. We have reliability, security, security, and redundancy, I think it's also. And where we can find this warning, file, line number, procedure. And we have some attributes here at the end, priority, state, finding an owner. 
we are setting them ourselves. I'm going to come back to them in a little bit. Uh, these uh, columns is configurable, so we can sort on them. Uh, we can move them around, remove them, show something else. But I can also create a chart here. So here I created a chart of the different warnings we have, and we can see that the tainted buffer access is the most common one here, 15, followed by nine null pointed references. And if I click on one, I get a list of all the, the warnings in that column. But for this demo, I usually show this buffer overrun. It's a single one in this analysis. And to have a closer look at the problem, we click on it. I'm going to make it a little bit more readable first. So to start off the analysis, maybe perhaps I don't know what the buffer overrun is. I can click on this red question mark and it will open up a manual for Codesonar that's built in. So every warning has a manual entry that we can read about it. So this is a read or write to data after the end of an object in memory. I can see uh, different uh, classes, different standards that is mapped against. So here we can see that this warning is uh, is in MISA 2012 and 2004, for example. And often it comes with code examples to explain the problem. Uh, okay, some more help we have. We have a trace back here that we can follow. So the benchmark code must be executed for a warning to occur. Now this is a very small example that we're going to to see in this uh, demo. But CodeSonar tries to explain how it sees what is happening. And we, so we've got certain events we can follow in the code. And this green arrow shows control flow information. And yellow triangles shows uh, important events. So I can click on this arrow here first. And we have event one, the taking true branch, test evaluates to false. So I can step here in the code to the next event. S is passed to SLN function. A string function returns the length of a string pointed to by S. SLN S, which evaluates to the length of a string pointed to by S, is passed to malloc function. And the malloc returns the address of a new object. Inside malloc, the capacity of a buffer pointed to by malloc as an S is set to the length of a string pointed to by S. And you can follow these steps all the way down for a warning to occur. So here we have a buffer overrun. This code writes past the end of a buffer pointed to by new lock. I can highlight that. New lock evaluates to malloc SNS plus one on row 2209. And if you take a look at row 2209, we can see that the problem is here. The problem is that the developer has um, managed to put plus one outside the parentheses, and therefore we get the buffer overrun. It's an easy mistake to make. Um, I personally like this warning because of this text comment from the developer. This doesn't have a buffer overflow vulnerability kit because we always allocate for enough space before appending. So that shows the developer was thinking absolutely correctly. He just implemented it a little bit wrong. Had he been, had he been using, he or she, been using um, static analysis, he would have found this directly and fixed it in less than five minutes. 
since I've uh, done this and I have analyzed different versions of this code, I've seen that this uh, problem existed for several versions later on. So, CodeSonar helps a lot by explaining what is happening in the code as CodeSonar sees it, so that you can understand the problem. Uh, so more help we have, we have a cross-reference down here, we can open up. So if I put my mouse over something here, I get information about that. Here we can see that new lock is a local variable, I can see the definition of it, I can see where I read from it and write to it. And put my mouse over something else. My look is a function. So you get a lot of help when you go to find out what the problem is. And perhaps you're interested in to see the different ways into this code that this warning can occur. So we can explore the callers here. So here we have a different path that leads to this function. And if I press check paths here, we start to have a look at the, all the paths into this code. So the red marked path here is the warning detected. So it's working right now. And perhaps I want to take a closer look at this path. So I just mark it from there and click view path. So here we have a benchmark code that is the execution path that we follow. So we can follow for this first function that we marked before and follow all the execution path down for this warning, warning to occur. And this is a huge difference uh, between uh, simpler tools like uh, PSLint. You don't get all these explanations and you can't follow the code this easy, this execution path. And I mentioned earlier these attributes, we can set them here. We can set a priority to this warning. High, medium, low, also pressed. You can set the state, assign, fixed, invalid, later new. It's possible to set up uh, that uh, every new warning in next analysis automatically gets state new. And we can just filter them out. We have a look only at the new warnings. So if you start static analysis on existing code base, it could be good to just make a baseline here and uh, perhaps only look at the new ones and then later on start working with old, old warnings. Finding, is it a true positive or not? And you can also set an owner to a warning and it's possible to uh, set up automatically so that uh, the person who has checked in the code automatically gets to be owner of this warning, so a correct person fixes it. And we can also create, write a note here. If we make a suppression, we should uh, explain why we do that, for example. And these attributes will be saved in history here. So if we make uh, any changes, all the history will be saved here. Uh, I can also mention uh, that there is a plugin for Jira. Uh, and if you're using that plugin, uh, it will be a little bit, a little checkbox will uh, appear here. So if you want to synchronize this warning with Jira, you can check that here. And it will synchronize with Jira. That was a very short warning, but a warning can be uh, bigger, of course. 
So uh, let's have a quick look at this leak warning. We can jump down to a warning location. Here we can see we have 30 events that should happen for this warning to occur. Uh, but we can look at the summary here. There are no remaining references to resource from line 504. Uh, the resources were allocated at line 504. And the last reference was lost, lost at uh, line uh, five, 537. And the resource has not been freed. And so far, we have a leak here. And I can press all events here. And we get all these explanations as before. So Cosana guides you to what is happening in your code as it as Cosana sees it and tries to explain the reasoning behind its warnings. Uh, that's uh, just two warnings we've been looking at, but we have some other things we can have a look at also. We can create charts and tables. I'm going to go into this project. It's a GNU chess project, the same project as I used to demo. But there I made analysis from version 505 to 603. And I would like to create a chart over the warnings in the different analysis to see the, how it has been, has been developing. So very easily I created the chart here and uh, we can see a slight negative trend between uh, 5.08 and 6.0. We have almost tripled the amount of warnings here. We would like to have a downward spiral. But if you take a look at the lines of code, you can see that it's almost doubled also between these two versions. But there could be some other explanations. Perhaps we have some new people on board that's writing code. And of course, we can pick out some reports from the analysis also. We can get them in XML, HTML, HTML, and PDF format. So we can take a look at the standard analysis report. So we get the summary of this analysis, number of warnings, and a number of warnings per class, warnings by file, warning instances, and some metrics, and come, come, come back to them a little bit. Or you can create your own report. It's very easy. It's a drag and drop here. Uh, we have created an example here, a MISRA report. So you can take a look at that in HTML format. So here we have a different uh, directives and rules from MISRA, but for this analysis, MISRA has not been turned on. So we're going to get some few warnings here. So ignore return value is, on, is uh, turned on by default, and it's also a part of a MISRA checkers. Also unreachable calls and so on. So it's very easy to create your own report. And uh, we can also have a look at metrics. I usually use uh, cyclomatic complexity as an example. 
cyclomatic complexity uh, looks at uh, how complex the code is. Uh, so the more paths there is in the code, uh, the higher it is, this number that we get, we get a value here from the functions. Uh, so the more paths builds up this value, and the more paths you have in your code, uh, the more harder it is to prove that it's working as intended. So we can take a look at one function here. And here we can see we got four and got nested while, lots of while. So here we get lots of different paths through the code and that makes it quite hard to prove that everything is working as intended. And I can mention as a reference, NASA in the US looks at cyclomatic complexity. And if you write a function that gets a value over 15, you have to rewrite your code. This could be useful if you have a look at your code today. Then you can say, we don't want to get any more complex in the future. So that's one way to use it. But there are different kinds of uh, metrics we can get. We can get blank line, code lines, comment lines, uh, and so on. And we can also compare different analysis with each other. Uh, let me go here, it's a better example. So let's take zero. We can compare this with uh, the previous one. We had with lots of increase. So I get the list with the different warnings, so I can see easily which warnings occur in either analysis or in both. So this is uh, my short demo of code sonar. Mikkel, I, I got a question here. Yeah. Uh, so it's about uh, reporting as well. So the question is, if, if you can generate uh, like this MISRA report automatically uh, when the analysis is completed and, and then uploaded that to, to uh, some uh, document server and the question is is yes so maybe maybe we can show a little bit yes Jenkins there yeah uh, let me see so here we are building uh, with, with Jenkins and we extract two different kinds of reports here so you can absolutely do that when you're building your code so if you open up build with parameters, I think you can see. Uh, okay, it, it's configure maybe. Uh, yeah. So if you take uh, the build bigger, I think here you have. Uh, the command lines for, for uh, generating the report in, in uh, that line. So here, uh, no, uh, uh, we, have, we have one, I think we have one uh, here. So probably uh, you just here we get, yeah, get you get the report and if you want it in XML or uh, HTML or PDF, uh, you can just get it automatically when you're done. And here it's it's moved up uh, to, uh, uh, 
to a directory that, that is re read by uh, Jenkins. So basically you, you can do uh, anything with a report or anything with a command line. So you can do whatever you want. So are there any other questions? Just uh, send it in the chat or you can open up your microphone if you want to talk instead. Yeah, the question was about uh, the, the support for safety. Uh, and I can talk a little bit about tool collocation. So basically, uh, Code Sonar is um, having a, a TIFF certificate that. Um, or actually it's not TIFF, I think it's Exida. It's American uh, equivalent to TIFF. So basically what you get is a safety manual, how you can set uh, code sonar, and you can also get access to uh, the latest bug list and so on. Uh, so all the things that is needed for a tool certification is provided in this kit. However, the tool itself is, or the settings uh, actually, the combination of how you use it in your environment, that is what needs to be certified. So that means that you you have code sonar that is a fit for purpose of, of uh, functional safety related things. You have a safety manual to uh, to guide you how to set up the tool. And you get a bug list that uh, for the latest bug, so you know what kind of things to consider. And then, uh, in combination with your uh, compiler and so on, that will be uh, certifiable. So you can certify that uh, via an audit company and so on. So there is a specific uh, certification toolkit that you buy to get access to, to these things that you need. It's a short explanation, but if you have uh, want to know further details, you, you can send me an email or call me. And I will explain it a little bit more. I don't think uh, there is no more questions at the moment here, at least. So I don't know, Michael, if you have got any <coughs> questions from. No, I haven't. Okay. You can always send in the questions to us later on if you want to. Yes. So uh, I think we will uh, end this webinar, this introduction. And if you are interested in, in uh, knowing more or try it yourself, please contact me or Henrik in Dem Denmark or Marco in Finland, and we will help you to, to uh, look into this solution, see if it fits you. I got a new question here. I just got a thank you. <laughs> so I, I say thank you also uh, for attending. And uh, don't hesitate to contact us at KnowHow if you want to know more about this solution. And uh, thank you, Michael, for the uh, demonstration, introduction. Thank you, guys. So, have a nice day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.